a Build Hatch developed production. Hello, I'm Aaron Kyle and welcome to another episode of Build Hatch. I know I keep saying this just about every single week, but episodes like this one are just truly inspiring. On this week's episode, you're going to hear the real story of how former bodyguard to the stars, Ben Doyle, started Fiducia Property Group. I love this part of this podcast, and this is a guy who simply tried, listened, tried again, and then made that his mantra to just keep listening and trying harder and harder. Ben is a really nice family man who simply values the importance of relationships and the importance of having transparency with their projects that they develop. And you'll get to hear this shortly. I particularly loved meeting Ben, his wife Marie, and his team at their Sydney office. It's amazing when you get out of a lift and you instantly feel welcomed by entering their display suite. And that's for their upcoming Neutral Bay project, Harriet. I particularly enjoyed seeing how Ben and his team operate and how they have a completely open office so you can drop in, visit their display suite, all the while by seeing the fiduciary property team hard at work right there behind the glass in their office. Like I said, these conversations really just get better and better. So let's get into it. Ben Doyle, welcome to Build Hatch. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. Your company is Fiducia Property. Yes. Which we're sitting here in North Sydney today inside your display suite. You've got a very clever strategy with having the display suite in, in your building. So I really like that. Can you tell us a bit about your company? Yes. Uh, so I started developing 2001. Um, Fiducia started uh, around 2004, I think it is. And then it was really about um, you know, finding a niche in the market and, and trying to carve out your own niche. Um, from that, we've been developing now for, uh, what are we, 16, 17 years under Fiducia. Uh, we've expanded into uh, you know, medium density, high-end residential homes and medium density residential high-end apartments, uh, which we and focused on North Shore and sort of inner, inner eastern suburbs. Uh, and then we've diversified a little bit more recently into logistics and we've got a large uh, light industrial site up in uh, Central Coast, um, which, which is great. So as a team, we, we're, quite, we're quite small as a team, quite focused. Um, and for us, bringing a display suite in-house was about rather than scrapping the cost of you know, tens of thousands on each display suite we'd end up building. Um, and the possibility of reusing products after a display suite, it doesn't happen. No, they, really d- they just get wasted, thrown out, gets demolished. Scrapped. And there's nothing worse than seeing, if you've ever seen commercial offices getting, getting stripped out, all the joinery, all the cupboards, all the melamine, everything just gets stripped and thrown in the garbage. Nobody can ever re, um, uh, repurpose it or reuse it generally. Um, so we just got sick of seeing that. So we wanted to rebuild our own purpose-built display suite and so we turn them over on a project to, but we'll keep carcasses and things and we'll re, re uh, we'll redo the, the main exterior surfaces of everything um, yeah it's a great strategy so you're able to fit that display suite out to suit your project correct and then as you said rather than throw everything out reuse and correct. rebuff it for, for the yep. next project yep and so, clients like coming in to see and meet the developer as well rather than going to the sales suite at a um, at sales agent's to actually come in here and meet us. They come into what where, where we are at the moment, we call the trophy room, it's all our awards and things. Uh, but they get a feeling of who we are by our offices as well, not just a facade of hearing the name of Fiducia. Now, that to me presents a couple of things. Now, the, the, the first highlight is having the developer at arm's length. Mm-hmm. You don't see a lot of that. So it's it's actually very welcoming. And, I, and it's not that common where you have the developer your product, you're on the same level. As you said, clients can come in here, they can see that. Mm-hmm. You're not running for the hills, so Correct. to speak. You're right there holding their hand throughout the project from start to finish. Correct. But recently we also had a, uh, once we got DA approval, we, we set a neighbourhood meeting and invited them all to, the, to our offices here. And so we asked all the neighbours around the project that we're about to build, come in and meet us all. We've got the DA approval. Um, let's, let's meet and let's all be friends. And so I spent the first 20 minutes just getting bollocked um, with questions and, and beating me up on certain things. And we said, look, we're just, we're going to be developing. We're, let's all be friends. We've put on a wine and cheese night. It's at our cost. We don't expect anything from you, but we're here. We're not going anywhere. Come and meet us. And we actually had a really good turnout. We had about 30 of the local residents that wanted to come and, and meet us and see who we were. Um, I, I, think it, I think it adds a little bit more value. Um, and you're right, it's not 
running away or being hiding behind your name. You're actually at the forefront of who you are and you're presenting who you are on a daily basis. Particularly when you are working in that high end market too. People want to be able to correct. People want to know who's behind the name. You know who's so. who's the developer and um, so you mentioned two thousand one. So that's a that's a long grind. Now yeah. tell me about Ben Doyle before that. So we always like to take it back. So yep. whereabouts did you grow up? I grew up down southern suburbs. So I grew up down south in San Susi, originally Kiama, and then grew up in San Susi. From San Susi, God, it was up to Wyoming. Then it was over to Adelaide. I escaped Adelaide as soon as I could as a teenager, uh, and came back. Uh, and then for me, growing up was it was um, uh, grew up in a in a, in a in a with a stepfather in, in house, and. It was every weekend grinding it away. And, and this is from about the age of, I reckon I would have been about eight or nine years old. Every weekend, my brother and I were renovating. We had no choice. We, we, we lived and breathed it because every weekend, our stepfather would force us to be either painting, landscaping, gardening, building fences, building patios, knocking down walls. So every home that we ever moved, and we moved a lot, is that we'd renovate. So we'd buy old crappy homes and my stepfather would renovate them. Um, Add the value and then sell and move on. And so you you had through our youth. So you were lucky enough to have that fortunate oh, I don't know work about ethic. <laughs> but that's that's where you learn work ethic. You do reckon. that that grind, do. that hard work. You're yeah, getting yeah. flogged. Yes. You know, no social life. You're out there yeah. earning your keep. Yeah, and if you didn't do that on the weekend, you didn't get your your, your playtime. Um, it was literally felt like every single weekend. And my mum used to work two jobs, so. Um, on Saturday mornings, it was it was the house duties first. So it was one of the great things about my stepfather that uh, he always made sure that my mum was looked after in that way. So we would have to clean the house out every weekend, top to bottom, everything, and then we'd have to do the renovation work on that day. Um, but it was, you know, it, I think, you know, I like to say that it wasn't, but I, I also think that there probably were a lot of great char- characteristics that I picked up from that. And you're right, the work ethic was definitely one of them. Um, I have a strong work, ec- work ethic in what I do and I grind away at what I do. Um, I prefer to work smarter than harder. Um, wherever I can be strategic and smart about our approach to doing it, I think it's, it's a much better way of um, developing. Um, you can, anybody can grind away, but it's the smarter. It's, it's the smarts combined with the grinding, which, which ultimately makes a better decision and a better business in the long run. Now, growing up, going through school, did you... Mm want to continue renovating or stay in the construction industry? What were you sort of aiming for after school? I had uncles, uh, a couple of uncles were in the building trades. So one was a roofer and one was a carpenter, a chippy. So I ended up, when I left school, I ended up uh, going into plumbing and did a plumbing apprenticeship. Um, from that, my uh, I learned a lot. You know, it was, it was understanding how much you could be worked for as little as amount of money as possible. You know, first year apprentice in plumbing, I think it was earning about $250 a week. And I was working easy 50 hours plus a week. And it's hard going. You, you're you out in the, in the heat and it's summer and the yeah, yeah. freezing cold in winter. Correct. And I'm 6'5", so at 6'5", I was getting – and I was the apprentice. And the, my boss at the time so – you were the gopher. I was the gopher. <laughs> and I was under houses. I was up in roofs. It was all domestic work that we did pretty much. We didn't do much commercial or uh, multi-storey building work. It was mainly all – domestic and it was mainly all sewers sewer choke and gas work so it was some um, great it was, conditions it was <laughs> it was tough work it was tough work. it wasn't enjoyable uh and then and then career-wise I took a bit of a turn and, start in, and uh became an entrepreneur at sort of I think the first business my cousin and I started was at 19 started importing and uh wholesaling clothing from the U.S. um fit and swear labels imported those um had a couple of retail stores in the city um, and then went on this sort of tangent in life, um, which you know, lasted for some time. But in between all of that also, which was um, a quite a different segue, it was uh, from boxing at the age of 17. I, I started boxing down at Caliber State in the city. And from there, it led me to a, a career in security, uh, which then led me to a career in bodyguard work, which had me travelling for about uh, off and on for about seven or eight years. Fascinating. Yeah. And that's what actually led me into property believe it or not, was my bodyguard work. So I travelled all around Australia so and you, New Zealand. So how was that? You, you got to develop, like, astute connections with yeah. people or...? More so, uh, yes, absolutely. So it was uh, a, a lot of a lot of movie junket. Um, when the movies launch, they'll, they'll do a touring junket for sort of four or five days, depending on how far around Australia is. 
um, and a lot of bands, a lot of rock bands, a lot of big um, touring shows and stuff that I used to work on, which were, were some of the most difficult work. Um, because <laughs> so you come had on, four we or five hours sleep, that was it, and you had to back it up the next day. Um, I reckon it would have been a pretty good gig. It was awesome. <laughs> You know, I've so, got some great memories from those years. You have to drop a name or two, surely. Um, I mean, I worked with, I had the pleasure of working with Arnold Schwarzenegger, Drew Barrymore, Adam Sandler, really? uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, I toured all around the country with. Um, God, uh, Van Damme, you know, some of the greats. It was, it was it was an amazing career. and it was, There's some big names it was, there. It was really awesome. It really was fun. Um, and it was, you know, our threat level in this country when I was doing it, you know, it was quite low on the, on the, on the spectrum. Uh, but it was still a, a, you know, you had to make sure it was always going to stay low. You couldn't just drop your guard and make, and just think, well, we're in Australia. There's no real great threat levels here because we don't have, you know. Um, oh, well, you, you're access. talking about Hollywood crazy right. stars coming to Australia. They need to feel comfortable. That, Absolutely. You know, so there they have six foot five. Yes. Ben Doyle. <laughs> yeah. And it was fun. But that's what segued me into uh, property, believe it or not, which uh, I ended up touring with a businessman that worked out of Double Bay uh, and he was in property. And he used to present and teach a lot of people how to add value to property. And it was from that that I ended up meeting him, worked with him and started touring with him. And he was my first major business mentor. Um, and Peter and I are still dear mates to this day. We're catching up in a couple of weeks up in Byron. Uh, actually, next week when I'm up uh, on holidays. And uh, he taught me the skill set of adding value to property, what to look for, how to do it, how to be able to actually build a business and create it yourself. Um, and that's when I... Because I was looking for something different. I was either going to be continuing my work here and my body go work in Australia or I was going to go off to the US or the UK. Uh, and it was through that meeting with Peter and seeing a different light and having a different perspective sh shown at me in property and, and linking back to my original skills, which were, you know, as a kid growing up, we were renovating. That's all we did. Uh, and so it was linking the two of those, adding value and then being able to adapt and, and push that even further. Um, and that's how um, that's how I got I got started. It just goes to show for the the people that are listening to this, you never know how far down the track that meeting someone or having 100%. a relationship or having a contact with someone, you never know when or how far that friendship yep. or relationship, whether it's a transactional rela relationship or or any sort of investment opportunity, you never know yep. where that may go in yep. future. Never burn a bridge. That's right. I've always believed in that. You never burn a bridge on the way through. Um, this, this, we we live in such a big country, twenty six million people, and it's the degrees of separation surprise me, surprise the hell out of me. It's a small um, world, it's isn't a it? Small, small world. Even now, more with social media. Um, you know the old saying of seven degrees of separation. I think it's almost at two degrees of separation now. Um, everybody knows you through a next connection or a next connection. It's it's and it's such a small business world when you get to a certain point in your business and you've got enough exposure. That circle it becomes even smaller because as everybody's learned or heard of you or you did a deal with them, oh, yeah, that was great. Yeah, we heard all about that. Or, you know, everybody's he here's your results and here's any of your downfalls as well. Yeah, there's definitely no no hiding. And, and that's where I like that transparency, looking out there and your display suite. And on one side, there's the display suite where potential buyers or investors, they can come in here and have a look. And then they can see through the glass or through the hallway there, there's your, your busy employees working away mm. so it's a great mix and and definitely a compliment to you now where to from there so we went through plumber yep bodyguard yep. potentially Holly, hollywood <laughs> so how did it come about you had your contacts so people want to know so how, how do you how do you go from that to a builder or a property developer how do you do it I, uh, the first segue into it was uh peter tasked me he said he said you know what do you what do you ultimately what are your goals been what are you looking for? And, the, and that this is at the time I was bodyguarding him and touring with him, but I was at him because I wanted to learn because I could see what he was doing. And it was my first real exposure to a successful businessman and being around him at this at, 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 and spending a lot of time. And I kept pushing and prodding and asking him the right questions, you know, you know, what do I need? How do I, how do I get to that next step? And he's like, well, you know, what is the next step for you? What skills have you got? Where do you want to be? You know, think about where you want to be. And so I kept um, asking him and questioning and, 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 working on myself about that and he said well go off and he tasked me to go off and do something the first task was go off and get your real estate license I said, fantastic so he just thought that would be the end of it didn't think i would pursue it and then uh, you know, several weeks later a few weeks later i said well i've got it i'm back and he only told me this later 
I didn't know this at the time, but at the time so he thought he, you were full. He didn't. He had doubts. He, he didn't think you'd do yes. it. Yes. Well, he said in his head, "This is what he told me later." He went, "Oh shit! Now I've got to fulfill this." Okay, because he told me, "You go and get that, and I'll set this up." So then he wanted to open a real estate division, which he did, and I started in that real estate division, and then within six months, I was running it, and it was just through sheer persistence, determination. And just wanting to get better at what I was doing, improve my own skill set and constantly be working on myself and what I was doing and the way I was presenting myself. The the skills that I didn't have, I knew that I needed to find and it was just about learning that and just adding to the layer each time and just adapting to it and understanding, I've got a good lesson there. Okay, that didn't work so well, got a great lesson there. And what I learned in the first six to 12 months was that I wasn't the type of guy that was going to sit down and have a cup of tea to get a listing for as a real estate agent. It wasn't my skill set. It wasn't my forte to be in there. So I looked further further afield and went, well, how can I get a math, uh, get more into a, into a bulk situation where I can get you know larger larger projects? So I met a, a builder. He tipped me into his first project at um, Oxford Street Paddington. Um, I sold all of those apartments out. I think it was. Roughly, there's about eight or nine apartments. Sold them all out in probably, it was about 12, so it was about three months, about 12 weeks. From that, he introduced me to the next person. He said, I've got to introduce you to somebody. You did great on this. It, you know, it was your first project. You got underway. You did it. And it wasn't, this is coming back to 2000. This is 2001. So there wasn't really a lot of big project marketing teams, or, or sorry, even mid-sized project marketing teams around like that. So... Um, so they were probably the days where you went to the site, there might have been a, what, display suite? Were they even no, then, back then? There was no display no. suite. It was just basically finished product and you were sold, sold from the finished product. Uh, and then he introduced me to another gentleman which had a building at Bellevue Hill, which was my first true project at Bellevue Hill. Um, that was an existing building, but it was a refurb model. So I sold all of the apartments, there was 32 apartments in there, sold 32 apartments and packaged together a renovation package. So it was um, company title, first first issue, company title. Um, second, I had to put a full renovation package. So I engaged builder, put together a whole scheme, engaged a color, artist to, a color scheme artist to come put through um, a look and feel for what we were going to present to everybody, priced it up. For the renovation model and the clients bought the unrenovated apartment at the unrenovated value, settled on it, and then I managed all the renovations all the way right through on the 32 apartments for the clients. I didn't get an upswing in the renovation. We just I all I did was manage the process of the renovations, sales, and hand and delivery over of it, and then to the uh, property managers and help them rent it out. So you effectively value added by correct showing a bit of nous, doing a bit of extra work. Yeah, and, and pounding the pavement, that little that oh, yeah. bit of extra just to keep to keep Correct. going. And that became the model that I worked on for about a decade, which was buying uh, wherever possible strata apartments, buying the strata lot, selling the individual strata lot with an internal and external renovation package, and then did that through buildings all across Sydney for about a decade. Right. Um, which worked immensely because the clients were buying at unrenovated price, so, you know, 400000 for a two-bedroom unit. And then they'd spend 20 or 25 on an internal reno, possibly the same amount, 20, 25 for the external. So 50 grand for the renovation costs, 400 grand for the unit. They'd settle on it. I'd manage all the works, hand it back over. It'd be worth 550 or 530, whatever it is. And they instantly found equity of, you know, 80 to $100,000. And that was the model. Right. Um, and it worked fantastic. Um, started finding out that, was running out of projects because that became a hot demand. Oh, there was word so much competition. Got out and yeah, competition. Yeah, that's what happened. Um, and but the model worked, and I still hear from clients to this day um, that you know. By the way, we bought an apartment from you like fifteen years ago, and we bought it for X amount. We've made like you know almost a million dollars in capital growth out over this time, and we kept it from kept it this whole time. So they um, want to give you a hug. Oh, it's great to hear. <laughs> it's great to hear. And, you know, and that's the beauty of time, I guess, as well. And that comes back also to what you mentioned earlier where you said it's about not only the hard work but having the smarts as well and Correct. combining the two. Correct. So thinking outside the box, value adding, seeing yep. what we can add to differentiate yep. ourselves with this particular project and going forward with the, the right connections. Yep. And for me doing those type of projects, it was great value for the clients but also for me from a developer perspective, it was low risk. Because I wasn't spending any money on the construction costs. I was, wherever I could, I was actually even optioning up. So if I could option up 10 apartments, 
and be able to then flick through the option, I wasn't, I wasn't paying. Uh, I was able to flick the option, they'd be settling on it, and then I'd take my margin in between. Um, so the strategy was fantastic, and it worked really, really well because everybody was winning out of it. You know, purchase, uh, repurchase, vendor that I bought it from did well. They were happy to sit, let me option it up, flick through the option to the end buyer, and then manage the full renovation work. So it was a win-win for everybody. Now, how does one, I guess, take the plunge? Like, think of your average Joe who who may be either a builder or they've got a nine-to-five job and th- these are the guys that are pondering and wondering, I want to get into property development or like on any sort of scale. Like what's yep. what's like a, a general rule to do? Like what would you say to someone like that? I mean, where to start or, or general rule of thumb looking at feasibility-wise? Um, um, I, I, always, I always have a 30-30-30. So we look at you know every 100%, but at 30-30-30 with a 10% buffer at the end, 30% on the buy cost, 30% on the renovation cost, there should be a 30% margin somewhere in there and a 10% buffer. You need to start somewhere, don't you? Correct, uh, 100%. Now, and it's all it's it's always easier when you look back in hindsight. Uh, for me, the biggest, biggest uh, lesson that I ever made was realising that all the ducks are never going to be lined up. It's never going to be a perfect situation for anything. Like I still... Feel uh, butterflies and and a little bit of fear and worry when I'm signing a contract for ten million dollars for a project, because I'm just hoping it's going to work out. Now I've done all of my homework to make sure I know it's going to work out, but at the end of the day, I'm still signing off and hoping that everything's going to fall back into place. So it's understanding that there's never going to be a perfect time, but there's always a perfect time. It's never going to be the best time, but it's always the best time. Does that make sense? It's always a great time to start because if you don't start, there is there's no there's no finish. That's right. You don't know where what could have happened unless you actually kick it off. Now, how do you get started? You know, uh, are you raising capital? So you know, there's a whole other we could spend hours on you know, <laughs> raising capital alone. You know, it's one of the key strategies for property. You know, and being especially here in Sydney, it's one of the absolute because it's so damn expensive for land here in Sydney. Um, you know, apartments. We're selling apartments at you know twenty four, twenty five, twenty six thousand dollars a square meter. If you said that 10, 15 years ago, people would say, you're crazy, you're never going to see real estate at that price um, unless you were sitting right on the harbour. Um, so it's it's understanding that all the ducks aren't going to be lined up. You've eventually just got to take the plunge and get started with something. Raising capital is absolute key to be able to do development properly in, in anywhere in this country or and anywhere does in that, the world. Well, the obvious statement is being able to fund and having that capital. But yep. if you don't have access to the capital and you can't, borrow funds via traditional means such as the bank, yep. then you need to use alternative means such as existing contacts, don't you? Correct. And that goes back to those early relationships about right. offering opportunities for investors and yep. things like that. That same, uh, my most profound mentor, Peter, he's still one of the great lessons he, he gave me when I said the same exact same question to him. Peter, how am I going to how am I going to get raise the capital for my first project? That's I don't have any capital. I didn't have anything to start. Um, and he said, Ben, it's going to sound crazy, but there's a secret to life in raising capital. And he said, there's billions and billions and billions of dollars that are transacted globally every single day, every single day, every single hour. And all you got to do is stick your hand out, and some of it's going to stick to it. And by that, which you can't say obviously now because we're on a podcast, but by Putting your hand out, actually putting your hand out and saying, hi, I'm Ben Doyle. You know, this is what I do. This is my research. This is what I'm creating. I'm creating a new property business. This is the type of work that I'm doing. This is the type of you know, stats that I'm putting together for the next project I want to, want to be undertaking. So it's about building a profile around you and building a story and building the research to be able to support why would somebody want to invest in you. Now, do you have to start off where you might be getting only 20% profit and you're giving 80% of it away to give somebody the, the risk profile that they're happy with? Maybe. Yeah, you, know? you might have to build those relationships and you have do. one or two projects before Correct. you can sort of Correct. ask for more money. Correct. You might have to profit. do it for project management fees to begin with. And profit comes you know, after a couple of projects. And starting off small, you don't need to do 100 apartments. You don't have to do 30. You, know, you could be doing a four, block of four townhouses. It's a perfect little start. Um, it's understanding numbers, understanding your feasibilities, understanding your market really well um, and who you're dealing with, who your end buyer is. Um, 
and it's one of the things in, in renovations and upgrading is that you can do any type of colour scheme, any type of look and feel you want, but if you don't have the end market in mind to begin with, you're just doing it for the sake of it. Um, and, you know, we don't want to do projects for practice. And, um, you know, and I've done two projects in my life which, which didn't work well. Um, and, the, and the mistakes were that I was trying to put my product that we do here in Sydney into a different marketplace and expecting it to be the same result. Um, and it was an expensive lesson. Yeah, look, I think that's a, a key lesson where you think the market's the same somewhere else and you apply the same demographics, Correct. but they, Correct. it could be as simple as a different taste. It could be a different demand for a product. The difference between postcodes could even yep. vary. So and it was. that's, you know, you, you said it before about having key research and statistics and, and having that excellent database of information. Yeah. Um, horses for courses, you know, Absolutely. It's understanding the right horse for the right course or understanding what, you know, a race car, you can't put wet and you can't put dry tires on a wet day. Um, it doesn't work. So it's understanding what product you have and what the market demands, um, you know, and not overcapitalizing. So, you know, you might sell it faster with less renovation work done so somebody can see the upside to it and they can still add to it. This is just in the renovation world. Sure. Uh, but again, it's, you know, understanding your market is if the demand is for three bedroom townhouses, but you're trying to jam a two bedroom townhouse just because that's all you can do, you're going to, you're going to hit less market space. Um, and it's always, if you, if you look at a triangle, I always like to work in the middle band. I don't want to beat the top point in. I don't want to beat the bottom. I just want to try and work in the middle because in the middle is where the most demand is, the most clients, the most buyers, the most sellers. Um, it's why we develop mainly in the North Shore and Eastern Suburbs. No matter what the climate is, and I remember developing through the GFC, there were still buyers. You now, you weren't making a lot of margin. You weren't, but you, you were still able to turn them over. You were turning money over. And that was the difference. There's the key. always buyers in those areas, and you've got to understand your market really well. Uh, because when markets turn, you don't want to be holding a lot of stock unless you bought really, really well and you're being able to get a great yield. Now, unfortunately, in Sydney, we don't get great residential yields. It's, you know, we get capital growth. But when capital growth stops, what do you got? If you're not getting yield, you're just sitting there idle, waiting, going sideways for a market, to waiting for it to turn back up again. So you just, yeah, you, that's important to keep ticking them over. Correct. Now... Explain to someone listening to this. I mean, the 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 time for from project from acquisition to to sale, mm -hmm. we're talking years, aren't we? To a completed project, can be, yeah, can be two years at least. Refurb is a much much faster model. I, I like ref, refurbing as a model, renovation model. Um, we don't do a lot of it now because we just don't we can't find the margins in them because they're, they're so hotly contested. But you used to be able to get good margins in them. But there's still good quality smaller projects out there for people if they're hunting them. Um, I like them from the from the risk profile because you've got an existing asset sitting there ready to go today. You just got to add the value, extend it, um, you know, put another level on the building, that type of thing. Um, so they're a much shorter time frame. Um, you know, you could be in and out within nine to twelve months. Um, a development time frame we're generally always around two to three years. Um, time is on your side, but it's also it's a long project. time though, isn't it? Really? Absolutely, it is. To realise a return, yep. you know, from yeah. start to finish, it's a long time. It is. And it is. people don't understand when, when you're a property developer, you, you're putting yourself out there for the long haul. Correct. And you've got to, um, you've got to try and uh, you know, time projects because you don't want them all finishing up at the same time because development can be quite a lumpy business. Um, you know, it's, it's expenses going out because you're developing, building, 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 construction, building, building, make sales, but there's nothing released. And then settlements, all of a sudden cash flow starts to come back in. So it's a very lumpy up and down business. Um, and so trying to develop different projects at different times and different locations helps with some of that lumpiness as a development business. For sure. Now, you mentioned trophy room. So we're recording this in your trophy room and yes and i'm looking around and there's a whole wall here covered in trophies um awards yeah. winners highly commended finalists uh everything so tell me a bit about these awards uh look it, it for me I, I it's a little bit of recognition for the industry that we're in and, and i do like it it's also recognition for the team for the work that all the team puts into it because it's not you know in development it's 
your, you've got your tradies, you've got your building teams, you've got your plumbers, you've got your surveyors. Our surveyors have been with us for 15 years doing work. Um, John Stevens. So we've got lawyers. Like it's an entire team that wins. Um, and it really is. This is the award is the piece of recognition in the industry that says, you know what, you guys are doing a really good job. You know, keep it up. Um, so, you know, we've got HIA awards, we've got um, UDIA. Um, our recent one with UDIA was for the uh, urban infill development of the year, small scale, down at uh, Clovelly, um, which was a beautiful project. Uh, and my wife, Marie, who also works with me in the business uh, in Fiducia, she won the Urban Development Institute of Australia um, Female um, in Construction Award last year. Um, so it's, you know, it's recognition for what we're doing. We get design awards from our marketing, our designers that, um, um, that put together our projects as well from the, the branding and the, and the placemaking from our, uh, of our projects, the design and look and feel. Um, now that's important and, and I, need, I need to stop you there because you said look and feel and when I came in here, I got to meet your lovely wife, Marie, but I, I went over to the table and, and we have a linen folder with a, a little drawstring that you can untie and inside, it's like you're getting a gift or yes. some sort of <laughs> wedding gift Yep. and and I'm looking inside and, and we'll put these up on our Instagram, but there's these key words and even down to the, the texture of the, of the presentation. We have own the moment, built to take, effortless, revel in long, lean lines. Yeah. So these are nice, lovely words yes. and, and the presentation all the way down to everything. You, you've thought of everything and, and teams on the back. Yep. So obviously that's part of your, your DNA. Absolutely. Uh, so Andy Hoyne, Hoyne Placemaking and Branding um, in the city, they do all of our... Um, our detail work when we're when we're putting together a project, we're trying to understand what the end buyer was, is going to be, what the location demands. Um, it's not just pretty words and, and pictures. It's understanding who your client's going to be, um, and understanding what sort of impact you can make in attracting clients to your product based on our presentation. Um, and what we've found in the last sort of three or four project. What's come out of it is that our the um, all of our projects take on quite a feminine role. So Grace of Northbridge, we've got Harriet of Neutral Bay. Um, so we're we're starting to see a real feminine role come out in all of our projects. I'm I've got three daughters. My wife that I you know, and my wife holds her own as in a developer in, in this business. So she happens to be my wife as well. But it's but I'm surrounded by women in, in my home and uh, in my personal life. And so it's it's really come out in what we do as well. Uh, and I find that um, working with a great placemaking and brand visioning team, when they understand who you are as individuals, they start to understand who your project can be and how they can develop a, a quite a lot more. Um, so it, it's great. It, we put a lot of work into that early on to get it right and nail it every time. Yeah, and I, I think it's also – and it's – it's also clear from sitting here talking to you that it's about that connection. So you mentioned about the early relationships, but you have that connection with, you know, your lovely wife, the, the, the employees that work here, all the way down to the relationships that are involved in. Absolutely. In, you know, and as you said, getting that recognition um, for several awards. So, um, well, Like I said, um, our surveyor, he's been with us for, it's actually over 15 years. I think it's about 17 years we use the same surveyor. I've gone. I've tried somebody else once when one of the team members said, "Look, you know, we're paying you know five hundred dollars extra for something on a, on a report, and let me just try somebody else." And it was the worst mistake. And I've just gone straight back. And ever since seventeen years, we've been. Yeah, I'm sure it's seventeen years with John Stevens. He's amazing. Um, but it's it's keeping a great team that I know I can count on, because if I've got to double check every time on every single minute detail, I need to make sure that my team's managing all this and I need to make sure that the team we've got around us is all doing their jobs at the absolute pinnacle that I, I would expect them to do um, without having to double check or triple check on everybody all the time. Um, so team is absolutely key for us, um, having a good long-term team that we can count on every time. Looking at this this presentation of Harriet, these, these vision cards inside these amazing linen folders, uh, yeah, very nice. You know, when you're selling just bespoke, um, you've got to offer to bespoke brochures and details. You know, each brochure costs just under $100 by the time it's finished. 
So it's, you know, you're offering a top quality product, you finish it up with a top quality product. Hence why our display suite is of that type of level as well. You know, it's people walking in there and st- sitting down and feeling what they're looking at could be their future next home. Um, so, you know, we want to give the clients a full bespoke finish from start to finish. So on that, tell me about Harriet at Neutral Bay. So 10 luxury high-end residences. And one of my absolute favourites, it's, well, there's well, quite a few favourites. But one of my absolute favourites is our Harriet Club downstairs, which is set up as a wine bar, um, club lounge. Um, it's only for the residents internally in the building unless they want to book it out and have a small function there. The sort of clients that we've been attracting into Harriet so far have been a client that's just looking for something refined and elegant and easy and simple and that's not in a large building, so there's only 10 residences, which is great. Um, the Harriet Club downstairs, um, the, in, the owners can book it out. They can have wine or cheese nights. They've got individual wine cellaring downstairs. Um, there's a hidden kitchen so people can um, host little dinner parties and things in there and TVs and club lounges and Everything could be set up the way we displayed it. Um, and the great thing also is working with North Sydney Council. Yeah. It's one of the things that, that at first I was, I was unsure about, but when we started in the design process, um, is that North Sydney Council wants you to keep a character of the, in the area by keeping exposed brickwork. They're really big on the exposed brickwork rather than rendering everything. And now that we've gone down this path, I absolutely love it because – you know, you look at a building that's been built well 100 years ago and the brickwork's perfect. You know, you gurney it off, clean it off, and you've got a beautiful building yet again. Rendered buildings, yes, they look great. They, they, they'll, they'll last every 10 years as long as you paint them and maintain them. But a, an exposed brick building it just has a certain level of elegance to it if it's done well. And now with the curved edges um, and the ec- extra accents that we're putting on this, this is why, uh, you know, one of the other reasons I love this building. Yeah, look, I, I love the old brick as well, and it's been really good to see the market drive demand for the older looking bricks. Yes, because even as recent as five or six years ago, you had if you wanted that look, you had to buy recycled bricks, and they were Correct. getting up like five dollars a brick. It was Correct. ridiculous. It was out of so control. yeah, to have the market drive that demand, it's um, it's you know diversifying and creating these really nice looking mm. buildings fitting in with the character of, yep. of the local surrounds like it is. So, um, yeah, it looks like a, an amazing project. So if people listening to this or they uh, are interested in buying into that development, how do they go about it? They can contact us directly. Uh, we've got McGrath Projects uh, as our sales team uh, working with uh, Colin Griffin or Murray Wood down there. Um, those guys are awesome. We've worked with Colin and Murray for God, off and on for about seven or eight years now. Uh, on multiple different projects we worked on uh, and they're, they're a great team. But um, they can contact us directly at Fiducia. We can um, introduce them to the guys and they'll look after them from there. And they can, you know, as mentioned before, they can pop on in and see us here. See this display suite. Yeah, absolutely. Now, outside of work, Ben, what does Ben like to do? I surf. I still box. Uh, you know, I'm up at 5 a.m., uh, four or five mornings a week. I'm trying to get five out during the weekdays, Monday to Friday, so I'm up at 5 a.m. and I'm in the boxing gym by 5.45 over in Artarman. Uh, and, you know, I'm I'm home around sort of 7.30 in the morning, so that's my that's the only actual time I get to myself because, you know, um, having three wonderful daughters, it's a, <laughs> it's a pretty full life. Uh, so mornings I'm up early, out to the gym, uh, and weekends uh, one of – I was – I surf, so I was able to introduce one of my daughters to surfing years ago, um, and she loves it that much that that's our thing on a Sunday. We'll go down to Manly and surf on a Sunday morning. Um, I do it with one of my best mates and his son and my daughter, eldest daughter and his son both um, went to primary together. So they spent six or seven years of school together, so they're still great mates. Um, So we surf on a Sunday, which is down at Manly on a Sunday morning. It's just absolute bliss. Paradise. Oh, it's it's, it's incredible. So it's, you know, for me it's... Being able to get my time in the mornings because it's you know there's a lot going on on a daily basis raising children working working together with my wife every day which I must say is an absolute joy uh, I wouldn't like it any other way if I could only see her for you know, a few hours a night and then be back at it the next day it just wouldn't be enough for me <laughs> um, so she's she's really awesome she really is um, so we have a, a, an amazing relationship and uh, so it's finding that time in the morning for me is key. 
Like it's hard getting up at 5 a.m. every morning and rolling over. You know, I just have to go into autopilot because if I wake up and think about what I'm about to do, I'm, I know staying in bed so much It's easier. easy to talk your way out of oh, yeah. that procrastination. And, oh, yeah. Yeah, can't and be bothered. But if you just right. force yourself to get out. Correct. You're and, up and about. And it's that it's the internal dialogue which will either – allow and push you to be able to do developments or stop you to be able to do developments. It's the same internal dialogue that that stops you getting up and training in the morning. We all have 24 hours in a a day. Why can so many people get so much done? And you look at them and go, how on earth can you get all that done in a day? Because a lot of that's the internal dialogue that you can just do it. You just got to get up and get at them. You know, at five o'clock, the alarm goes off. It's quiet, but I just know that instantly, if I think about anything other than just turning up and getting out of bed, I'm going to I'm going to get distracted. So just and I have a set routine and a pattern to get me out the door. Um, and what I did find was I was I was struggling some mornings, and I had to cut out. I spend literally about five minutes looking at social media just before I was about to walk out the door. And this is like five twenty in the morning, right? I do a couple of things, and then for five minutes I look at it. It was actually distracting me. It was it was throwing me down that much. I had to stop it and just go. You know what? Just focus on what you're doing. Focus on getting the outcome, have a cup of tea, get ready to go and leave the, out the door and just keep on in one path rather than getting distracted with multiple different things that were popping up in, in my feed or that I was looking well, at. Well, it can set the mood about. for the day, can't it? You know, it's everything. And it just distracts you and takes your focus away from what you need to do. Correct. 100%. So I have a set routine. I do it. I, I systemize it so I know that what I'm doing. Same for when I come into work. I have a set routine every day. You know, the team... You know, everybody has a reasonably set routine, but then we'll jump in between and we're talking, we're networking, we're speaking to each other constantly every day. Like I can see Marie talking to one of the team members now. This is what we do as a, as a, having a small team, which is really quite nice. Everything's visible. Correct. We're all in an open office, which is what we wanted. Like a family. Absolutely. I, I never want to be in my own office cut off from the rest of the team because then having to knock on the door and talk to me, you know. Yes, it has... S- some pitfalls in having an open office at, at times. Sure. Um, you know, it's usually at about 3.30 every afternoon when the kids call and ask you for different things and they, if they can't get hold of me, they try and get hold of Marine. We're going to go, well, actually, no, is there a better way of doing this right now? Uh, but it's, it's that constant interaction with us as a team which keeps us well-oiled as a machine. For a small, small team, we get a hell of a lot done um, and we love doing it. Um, and, and I think that's... Attracting good members around you that stay with you for a long time, I think that's that's key for me. Yeah, look, I've really enjoyed talking to you, Ben, and it fascinates me every single week uh, getting around, interviewing guests and, and hearing their story. And your story is one of those fascinating stories that people wouldn't normally hear about, you know, no. and, and sit back and drive past and see your sites or those 30 people that potentially came and had a look and looked at your project and came in for cheese and biscuits. These yep. are the stories that people don't get to hear about. So I love it and uh, I really appreciate you coming on to Build Hatch. So thanks Thank for your you. time. Thank you. It's been awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. Well, that was another Build Hatch episode with Fiducia Property Group Director Ben Doyle. What a story. And I really encourage you guys to check out their amazing Harriet project, which is in Neutral Bay in Sydney. As usual, please check out our Instagram where you'll be able to learn more about our guests and the projects that we talk about. Have a great week and you'll hear me again on the airwaves next week. Thanks for listening to another episode of Build Hatch. You have experienced a Build Hatch developed production.